I want to welcome you to breakout session A, age-related macular degeneration, current treatments, and emerging possibilities. Uh, if you are in the wrong section, quickly move, because I hear that they've just started. Um, I'd like to welcome Dr. Bob Gendron back, uh, our conference co-chair. Uh, welcome him back to the podium. Uh, Dr. Gendron will describe the causes of macular degeneration, its diagnosis and treatment, and will summarize the research into new treatment possibilities. We'll make sure that there's time for your questions at the end of Dr. Gendron's talk. And please welcome back Dr. Bob Gendron. Thank you very much, Aaron. Uh, and thank you all for coming to my session. I guess I have the smaller of the sessions, but uh, it's just as important as the, the other sessions. So uh, thank you for being here. Um, what I'd like to do today uh, here is, is a little less formal than what I just did. So, uh, you know, again, I'd, I'd like to try to go through the, 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 uh, the, the causes of, of both types of AMD, age-related macular degeneration. And if, if that's okay, I'll use the AMD term. Is everybody okay with that? And again, I'd like this to be a little less formal than my keynote talk. Um, that's why I wore my suit today. But please stop me and interrupt. I mean, if there's something that I'm saying that's, that's too much or if you don't understand uh, some terminology, just raise your hand or shout out. I'd like this to be a little more interactive if possible. So what, what I wanted to try to do today was describe the, uh, the state of the art of the disease spectrum uh, of AMD, age-related macular degeneration. And it's really the, the aging term is so important because it really is a process that develops over many years. Some individuals have age-related macular degeneration that develops very rapidly when they're younger, but that in, in some cases might be Overla overlaid with, the, with another type of retinal disease. So that, that's, that's a little bit different. But the mo most of these forms occur in aged individuals. And again, that's important for our province now because in Newfoundland and Labrador, we're seeing a kind of a skewing of the population. There are more and more aged individuals here. So it's an important problem for our province. But what, I, what I'd like to try to do is, is try to form a picture in our heads of, of the, the, the tissues in the retina that are affected over years and, and that get impacted by age-related retinal degeneration. And uh, if we think of the eye, we have an incredible machine in our heads, the, these two eyes that we have. They're like, they're like machines, and they act so that we can see our, our world. And when we have a, a, a ray of light coming into our eyes, it has to pass through a number of structures in order to get to the cells that are central to the vision, and those are the photoreceptor cells. So uh, I, I like to make the analogy of the photoreceptor cells, and, and uh, that Dr. K. Wett did this last night, and I, I, I really like the analogy, is that the photoreceptors are like the engine of the retina. They're really kind of, again, if you think of a motorcycle, they're the engine of the motorcycle. And in order to make that motorcycle work properly, those, those engines have to be well-oiled, and they have to work properly, and they have to be in good order. So the photoreceptor is the cell, that actually is detecting the light rays that come into our eyes. And a lot of tissues are involved in supporting those photoreceptors. So if we go through the eye, the light ray is going to be coming into the eye. It's going to be going into a couple of other tissues that are in front of the photoreceptors. And those tissues are retinal neural tissues. So they're very important, but they're in front of the photoreceptors. So there's actually a layer of cells in front of the photoreceptors that the light has to go through to get to the photoreceptors, okay? The, the retinal uh, neural cells are, uh, don't people don't think they're so involved in development of AMD, but they're, as I'll tell you later, they're very important in some approaches that people are thinking about how we can deal with AMD. So I'll get to that a little later, but let's continue our journey through the, through the eye. So as, as the light ray is going to be going through the, the, the retina, it's going to be going through the neural retina, and then it's going to be encountering the photoreceptors. And those are the cells that are going to be reacting to the light rays and then sig sending signals to the brain, to the visual cortex, right? And then behind those cells are what we call the retinal pigment epithelium. And that cell layer is, again, very important in supporting the photoreceptors. And a as we see in many forms of AMD, it's those retinal pigment epithelial cells that are the ones that are becoming diseased or abnormal as the disease progresses. So uh, just one more little bit of our journey. If we go behind the retinal pigment epithelium, we actually have a layer a kind of like a, what we call a basement membrane that's kind of like a layer of acellular or non-cellular material that protects the photoreceptors and acts like a kind of like a sieve 
that allows the nutrients and toxins to go back and forth through that layer into the photoreceptors. So that's a very important layer as well. It's called Brooks membrane. And that also has very high impact in how the disease develops. And then finally, behind Brooks membrane, we have the choriocapillaris, or the choroid, and that's the blood vessel system that leads to wet AMD. All right, so some, some people are dealing with wet AMD where you have blood vessel overgrowth in the retina, and the, the blood vessels that are involved there are from the choriocapillaris. So in setting this up, I'd like you to keep in your mind's eye, you're, you're, you're going through photoreceptors to retinal pigment epithelium, and then Brooks membrane, and then the choriocapillaris, and those tissues are central. They're central to the way the disease develops, both in the dry form and then later if it progresses to the wet form. So if we, again, think of the eye, we have in our eye uh, a little bit temporal or more toward the ear are what we call our macula. And I'm sure many of you know this already. Your macula is the point in your eye where you have the best vision, the, the, the best sharpest central vision. And at the macula, you have a little bit there about a half a millimeter across called the fovea. And the fovea contains about they think 100,000 photoreceptors, and those photoreceptors are mainly detecting color, so 100,000. So if we think about how we can compare that, say, to the brain, in the brain we have, people think there's about 100 billion cells, All right? So if you think of a brain disease, you know, you have 100 billion cells in the brain that, that, that could be marginal to the disease location. In the fovea, you've got only 100,000 photoreceptors. That's really not a lot of cells. So if anything goes wrong in that particular little tiny area, that's going to affect, uh, impact people's central vision. And of course, that's what people with age-related macular degeneration live with. They live with loss of their central vision. So what we know is that, and I'm sure you know this, that about 3% of Canadians now are, are dealing with some form of age-related macular degeneration, either the dry form or the wet form. So that's a lot of people. And we know that it strikes when people are, are past age 55 in general. Um, it, it's actually, uh, uh, it starts out with what we call a dry form, where we don't have blood vessel grow, overgrowth, but then it might progress in a small portion of those patients and that's, uh, that's about 15% of patients that might develop the more severe form, or what we call the wet form, where we get those, those blood vessels from the choriocapillaris that I talked about growing too rapidly and too quickly. And the other problem is that when they grow like that, they leak. So they're, like, they're almost like a garden hose. The, uh, the analogy I like to use for that is the garden hose. You have your regular garden hose, and then you've got your soaker hose, okay? And those are the soaker hoses are where you've got the little holes in the hose. Well... In wet AMD, your, your blood vessels in the choriocapillaris become more and more like a soaker hose. All right? they, they Usually they transfer nutrients and they take up toxins, but if those holes are too big, they're going to leak everything out, and that's going to damage the tissue. And that's what's going on in wet AMD. All right? So getting back to the, the, uh, the disease progression, we know that the disease starts out in the dry form, and many people will be uh, you know, dealing with the dry form of the disease. And that's, uh, as we know in, in the scientific field now, uh, the, the dry form has a, 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 very, uh, a very complex, what we call pathogenesis. And pathogenesis means the progression of the disease over time. And as we know, if it's an age-related disease, there are many years where we get changes in the, in, the, in the retina that develop into this dry form of the disease. So how does it start? Well, people think that in terms of the disease starting, that it, it's really... Um, one of, the, one of the biggest problems is that what you get initially is the deposition of what we call lipids and lipoproteins, which are, are combinations of, of fats and proteins that kind of ball up into little, little what we call um, uh, drusen that deposit along that layer of cells that I told you about, the retinal pigment epithelium and the Brooks membrane behind it. So these drusen are, they're either soft drusen or hard drusen. Some, some of the ophthalmologists will divide them into those two types of, of, of drusen. They will start developing or depositing along that membrane in the back of the retina, particularly around the fovea. Okay? And uh, people have found that these drusen um, uh, are kind of like uh, the analogy is made with uh, atherosclerosis and heart disease. 
So many of you know that some people have, uh, some, some might have a, a genetic predisposition to what we call hardening of the arteries, where we get buildup of protein and fats along the inner artery wall. It's very similar with the drusen. You're getting buildup of these lipoproteins that are forming little droplets and then changing in chemical form and becoming toxic to the surrounding retinal tissue. And people have found that these, uh, these drusen contain all kinds of uh, harmful chemicals. And some of these are uh, lipofusions, which are chemicals that can react when light hits them. And when light hits them, they kind of activate and form uh, harmful uh, byproducts um, that we, we call uh, mainly oxidation. So uh, there are other chemicals in there called uh, inflama pro inflammatory proteins. Uh, and these are part of the immune system. Uh, one very important protein that we find in drusen are parts of the complement system. And the complement system is uh, a system w which we all have in us that's an, an innate system that allows us to fight things like bacteria and, pro and viruses and parasites. Well, in these drusen, we're getting deposition of these complement components abnormally. And it's as if the complement components are then recruiting in uh, uh, a reaction against the drusen and then a reaction against the surrounding retinal tissue. The other thing that the drusen contains is lipids that have been, become, as I mentioned earlier, oxidized. And uh, if you want to make an analogy, the oxidation reaction that you see in these drusen is kind of like the rust on your vehicle. You know, it, it's, it's when you get a breakdown of the normal uh, material. It's also like if you bite an apple and wait an hour, the apple's going to turn brown. That's because of the effect of monooxygen onto materials, and it breaks the material down. The same thing is happening in these drusen in the eye. And uh, one of the exciting things that they found over the last uh, five, or five or ten years is that if you try to change the diet of individuals with, uh, with the, the earlier form of a AMD and try to lead them into a diet that contains antioxidants, and chemicals that can uh, sop up those abnormal oxygens, that that actually helps the AMD. And it's been found that this formulation of vitamins that's been uh, uh, studied through what we call the AREDS, or age-related eye disease study, that formulation of vitamins actually will decrease your risk of progression of AMD in the dry form by about 25% over about five years. So it's, it's a worthwhile thing to do. Um, in talking to some of the clinicians that deal with these supplements as a form of, of, of dealing with AMD, many clinicians think that it's best to get these types of supplements from a healthy diet. And that really can't be stressed enough. Uh, we, we wanted to have some of the clinicians here today, but unfortunately we couldn't get any. They're all at a, a, a retinal meeting in another part of Canada. But in talking to the, to the one that's local here, he couldn't emphasize enough the importance of having a diet that's high in antioxidants. All right? So you could take the supplements. Um, they're, they're, they're beneficial. They're effective. But as well, you, know, you can get similar benefits from a healthy diet. And there were studies done uh, initially. The Yes? Yeah? Yeah? Okay. Well, the, the foods that are high in antioxidants are things like... Uh, it, it's, it's fabulous for Newfoundlanders because berries are very high in antioxidants. Blueberries, partridge berries, uh, you know, the, the bake apple, those are very high in antioxidants. Um, we have things like chocolate that are high in antioxidants. And believe it or not, red wine. So this disease ain't that bad. I mean, oh. <laughs> so I, it, it's things like that. And the, other, the other interesting thing about AMD is that people have found that, again, going back to the fats that are being deposited along this Brooks membrane, those fats can be modified, again, by diet. And, and people are now, in the last few years, have been finding that in, in, ingesting omega-3 fatty acids, which you get from fish, and certain types of nuts and other supplements as well from these vitamins, that can affect how those, those harmful lipids and fats are de deposited along in those drusen. So again, eating things like salmon, oily fish, sardines, tuna, would be very good for a diet uh, for someone that might be facing AMD. All right, so so those, are, those are very important uh, factors that you can modify by, by your own free will. And the, the yeah, did, did you have a... Oh, no, yeah, I'm, I'm just I'm microphone. Yeah. yeah, I was just thinking that yeah. uh, it's sort of a link to cholesterol or? 
Yes, oh, absolutely. The people have people have been studying the role of cholesterol in in this particular process. And again, uh, the way cholesterol is metabolized by the cells in the retina is very important. And people think that now, uh, the the way cholesterol is metabolized in 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 early stages of AMD might be abnormal. So that uh, again, modifying that in general, people think that. Uh, Decreasing your overall fat uh, intake is probably best for AMD. Uh, changing the type of fats you eat from fats that might contain high cholesterol to those that contain things like omega-3s is better for you. Because, it, again, it shifts the balance of fats in the retina from a bad form of fat, like some of the cholesterols, to a good form of fat that will not feed into these drusen. But that's a very good question. Yeah, yeah. and another thing, uh, uh, when I started with this, say, about about seven years ago, AMD, I yeah. spoke to my doctor about uh, taking the Vite Lux. Mm -hmm. Oh, he said, what do you think? Well, I said, I don't know, you know, because I had no idea yeah, like, or microphone. anything like that. Yeah. And, uh, well, he said, <laughs> you know, just went with his head like that. Don't bother, <laughs> you know? And uh, I didn't take them. But now, I... Uh, I look after myself. Yeah, right. I try to eat a healthy diet. Yeah. Uh -huh. I have fish, berries, and all right. that, and yeah. I don't smoke, I yeah. don't drink, and, yeah. you know, I sort of take care of myself, but, right. yeah. and here I'm blind. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's, I know, and, and, and again, it goes back to the clinical studies that have been done. The, 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 uh, the numbers of patients that benefit significantly from these forms of dietary modification or supplements is, is, is not really high. I mean, it's a quarter of the patients, okay? So, or it's a, you have a, you can decrease your risk by one quarter over five years. So it's not all the patients, I, I unfortunately have to say, that, that will benefit from this. So, you know, it, it, it's going to benefit some patients. It, it can't be bad for you overall to, to have a healthy diet. And it may actually, uh, it, you know, it may block the further progression of the disease. And, uh, you know, and I don't know what form of the disease you have, but it, the, the, uh, What's interesting and what's frightening is that along on the background of dry AMD, you have always have the risk of developing wet AMD. So those of those patients that have wet AMD, where we have blood vessel over overgrowth from that choroidal capillaris that I talked about earlier, those patients usually develop the wet AMD on a background of dry AMD. Right. So if you've been going along for many years with dry AMD and you don't take care of yourself, and you don't w follow your diet, you know, take antioxidants, you're at higher risk of developing that more severe form of wet AMD, okay? So it, it can't be bad for you, even if you've lost uh, a lot of your vision, to keep on that healthy lifestyle, because you don't want to develop the wet AMD. There, there's other consequences to that, and the wet form is where we have, again, blood vessels that grow abnormally from the back of the retina, from the choriocapillaris, and they break through that Brooks membrane, and then they spill their contents all over the retina, and they further lead to injury of the retina. And of course, injuring the retina in any way is, is bad for your eye health overall. It can it ultimately affect the optic nerve and all those structures that are downstream of the optic nerve that go all the way into the brain. So we want to avoid the, the progression to wet AMD. So what you're yeah. saying, taking Vitlux is really a plus. It, it's, it's been shown by clinical studies to be a plus. Mm -hmm. But I can also say clinical studies also show that healthy diet with the right ingredients and antioxidants and the right spectrum can be just as good. Well, yeah. when I say healthy diet, I go in for broccoli, fish, yeah. sardines, yeah. berries, yeah. and, yeah. you know, I don't know if that's a healthy diet, but yeah. Yeah. to me it's a, you know, mm -hmm. it's a very good. Yeah. But I get hung up on this fight lux thing, you know. I said... You know, I was, I was really good at that. Yeah. And yeah. then when I spoke, you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, you know, as if to say, don't bother, don't waste <laughs> your money. That's the every ophthalmologist is different. Yeah. And again, I'm not a clinician, no. so you know, I'm a researcher, so I really yeah. can't, I, I can't <laughs> speak to that. But everybody's different. Yeah. You know, some people may want to approach it with a supplement. It might be easier for them. Uh, you know, they might not be, they may not, might not be able to, f to follow a healthy diet or lifestyle, and so it's easy for them. But it's not for everybody. But there are two studies, two very large studies, one from, from Netherlands that involved about 5,000 patients that showed that diet it can be as good as the supplements. And, and you had a question as well? Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm asked Please. by Oh, if you could use the micro oh, microphone. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was loud enough. <laughs> anyway, yeah. I'm on Vitalux. Yeah. I've been for about five years. Yeah. And there's been no change. No change, right. No yeah. change in it. And yeah. uh, it's dry, I think. 
Yeah. But I've only had this, I'd say about eight years. I know yeah. it was that long. Right, yeah. yeah. But I, I find it excellent. There's no change. And yeah. uh, I, I live a very healthy life. I walk yeah. about seven kilometers a day. Fantastic. And um, I eat well, mm. and I go to, and I sleep well, and I don't drink red wine. <laughs> <laughs> you don't drink red wine. Well, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're, they're, you don't have to drink red wine. Some of us do. We like it, but <laughs> you don't I have don't to. Like it. <laughs> Thank you. And there's a question over here. So. <laughs> Can you tell right now roughly what proportion of people with dry AMD <clears throat> will, over a certain period of time, uh, develop uh, wet AMD, and yeah. secondly, uh, what proportion of people with wet AMD in one eye mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. who are on uh, the uh, vitamin and so on therapy yeah. for dry AMD in the other eye, yeah. <laughs> what proportion of, of, of those will go on to develop it in both eyes, the wet? Right, right. very good question, and uh, uh, I do have an answer for that. The studies over the last 10 years or, or more have, have shown that about 15% of the patients that are progressing through dry AMD will encounter some form of wet AMD, okay, 15%. So it, it's pretty low, but um, of those 15% that then might develop wet AMD, uh, the, the proportion, uh, in, if you have that in one eye, you have, uh, I think it's... Uh, about a four to 12% risk per year of developing it in the other eye, okay? So that's, that's, the, that's, that's the bad news, right? The, the good news is that, as I said earlier here in the keynote talk, that there is a treatment, as you probably know, for wet AMD. And this is a treatment where we actually target the blood vessels, so we, we have an antibody, uh, which is, again, part of our immune system that uh, companies have highly humanized, so they've, they've engineered it to be so that it won't be rejected by the body. And these antibodies are directed against a protein that's important for that blood vessel growth. And, and we can, uh, ophthalmologists can inject that directly into the eye. And uh, about a month ago, I, I, I shadowed the local ophthalmologist, Jim Whalen, in his clinic. And I, I, I saw some of the injections. And um, I, I was blown away by how some of the people took these injections. I always thought as a researcher that there would be gruesome and, you know, and, but... The people that had these, mainly a aged individuals, they, they laid back and they took these injections incredibly stoically. And I, I, I couldn't believe it, and I take my hat off to, to the people that are getting them because it's amazing. But, you know, to me, it didn't, it didn't look as bad as I thought it was. And, and that particular treatment actually works. Um, it has uh, the ability to stop disease, and it also has, in some cases, the ability to have people regain some of their vision and some Snell and letters that they, they lost. So it, it, it's, a, it's a good treatment. It's pretty much the gold standard now for wet AMD. And it's actually a treatment that many people are, are going through. But what we're doing here in St. John's is we're trying to figure out how we can supplement that type of treatment and maybe get around the injections. And we're working on a chemical or a, a protein in the eye that we think regulates how those blood vessels leak. So going back to the garden hose analogy, we're trying to figure out how we can stop that leaking. And Elan and I in the lab are working on trying to figure out how we can use other drugs that, that some of these drugs are used in other fields, again, to try to complement the anti-VEGF therapies that are being used. So uh, our work is in the early stages, and it's just going th now through progressing into ma uh, mouse studies where we're testing these in mice. But we hope at some point in the next decade or so that we might move this toward, again, toward clinical trials where we can supplement those types of treatments and get people away from injections. So, but very good question. Yeah. Well, my eye, uh, I have dry in this one, yeah. and it started about seven years. Mm -hmm. But it went to this one. I've had 31 injections. Uh, st first to start with Avastin, which is much Avastin, now it's Lucentis. Right. Yeah. So I've had 31 injections. Wow. Now yeah. I say it's really no change, but I don't know how far I might be blind. I mean, right yeah. now I can see your shadow. I yeah, can't right. read, can't drive, yeah. can't yeah, yeah. read that. But mm -hmm. and uh, I can see, yeah. get around, do my housework. Right. So I don't know yeah. how bad it would be. Yeah. But I go every month. Yeah. And I've been going every three months. Yeah. Since yeah. seven years ago, wow. but yeah. I didn't yeah. know I had anything wrong mm -hmm. until I just couldn't see out of that eye. But that eye, I guess, is still dry because I haven't had any treatment in this one. Yeah, and both of them are the same now. Yeah. So so you, you, my eye, yeah. this dry eye, yeah, is going to go to wet then. 
Well, Probably. as I said to the other gentleman, it, it's a low percentage, for about four, you know, four to twelve percent uh, chance over over five years that that eye will also become wet. So, it, yeah. it's relatively low. But the, again, the good news is that yeah, the, the the good news is that there are trials now for new forms of that type of drug. So p the uh, the the work that's being done now is to try to engineer engineer that drug further so that it it, it it's more effective and that it stays in the eye longer so that you can get less injections and that it, it treats in a more effective way. So those trials are being done now in the U.S. And, and hopefully in the next few years they'll trickle up to Canada. So there's hope for, for different forms of Avastin and Lucentis type drugs, but a, again, a, a couple of years down the pipeline. So hopefully for you, you'll be in that larger proportion of patients where you will not get development of, of that other eye to wet. And that and at, during that time there might be more treatments that might come along if it happens. Yeah, you yeah. Know, both eyes. Both, you know, even though I haven't had treatment in that one. Yeah. But I've had 31. Yeah. But after yeah. 31, yeah. you don't feel it. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, I mean, it's incredible. I, I really ad admire you people that go through it because, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's all we have, though. That's the problem. And, you know, and, and this, as I said earlier, when I started out my career about a decade ago in vision research, uh, there were really no treatments at all. So at least now there's something we can do, at, to, for, and some patients are benefiting. Not all will, but there, there's some that will. So is this the best one now? I'm sorry? Lucentis. It's is the best one now. Is it, that the best It's the best one now, now. yeah. And, and I'm, I'm confident that the local clinicians, Dr. Whalen, the, the people here that, are, that, that yeah. are doing these treatments are, are, have access to the best drugs the ones that have been tested in clinical trials and the best ones that are available. So there's really, there's not much else you could do. If you went to the U.S. to try to get involved in a trial, you, you wouldn't even know, the problem with trials is that you wouldn't know if you were getting the drug or not because they're randomized, all right? And that's the only Thank way you. we can test them. So, but your question is a great question. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if this is the right time in your talk, but uh, it's, yeah. it's on, the, on the drugs. Is there, first of all, any indication that someone is going to apply for Avastin to be actually certified for injections in the eye? Because it's, I understand it's an awful lot cheaper than Lucentis, but it's not packaged right and so on. And then yeah, the second yeah, question right. is, there's another drug called, I think, Ilea or something like that. Yeah, that Ilea. is, I, yeah. I, I've heard that it has been certified in the United States, in maybe other countries, Australia perhaps. Yeah, right. yeah. Is it going to be certified in Canada? Because I'd love to be able to get the injections only once every couple of months instead yeah, of every I, four I'm, weeks. I'm sure you would. And, and I, I can tell you that as soon as the, the, if, if the ILEA trial is, is, uh, uh, is positive and if that drug becomes FDA approved and it's actually used in the clinic, it will be used here. Because, again, that's, that's a very similar drug to Lucentis, Avastin, but it, it's designed to be more effective, as you just said. So, yes, I think as, as, long, as, as soon as those are, are being used in the U.S., you'll soon after see them being used in Canada. Right now, they're not. And I asked Dr. Whalen about this, and the only one he has access to right now is, is Lucentis. So your question about Avastin, I, I believe it, it differs from clinician to clinician. And, again, I'm not a clinician, but... Avastin was used originally as, as the drug of choice for treating this disease, and it was used, as you know, off-label. So ophthalmologists didn't have approval to use it, but they could use it because it, they found it effective. So I think it depends on what clinician you see and what their opinion is. And, I, you know, again, I'm not the one to, to give, be giving advice at that level, but the, Dr. Whalen thinks that they're equally effective. Uh, again, price difference. Hi, I just came from Retina Canada actually yesterday, so I'll just speak on behalf of what I heard from clinicians that were out there. So basically, most people get Avastin because that's what the MSP provides you guys, so then that's what they get. So different provinces have different rules in terms of what injections um, is covered. Um, but most studies prove that Lucentis is better than anything out there right now. So I think if you have more questions, uh, you should ask your um, ophthalmologist about it and all that. But currently, Lucentis is still at the top of the ranks until they prove otherwise with ILEA. But ILEA is still on trial, mm -hmm. so they can't say anything about it. So. Yes, we have another question. Sorry I'm late, but okay. we got kind of confused about all this. 
I, as a matter of fact, I had an injection yesterday of a okay. vaccine. Right. And, uh, <coughs> sorry, mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, I am told by my ophthalmologist that really there's no difference and Avastin is just as good as Lucentis hmm. and uh, why not go for Avastin because it's so much cheaper. Here yeah. it's yeah. nothing versus nearly $2,000. Yeah. Yeah. And <clears throat> the thing is, I read somewhere that the molecules of the of, uh, of the Lucentis right. are smaller uh -huh. and they more easily enter the retina. Yeah. Now, I don't know if there's any truth to that or I, I've been getting conflicting reports mm -hmm. all, all these years yeah. and uh, I, I just don't know what to be doing. But now I've yeah. been told mm -hmm. yeah. in the last two months, I've had two now in the last two yeah. months, yeah. that Avastin is just as good yeah. and why not go for it? Yeah, the problem, the, the real problem. Is that problem, right? Well, it, it's the real, the real problem is that the Lucentis is the only one that's really gone through the, the clinical trials. And, yeah. and the Avastin, although it's been used longer by ophthalmologists, it hasn't gone through as much clinical testing as the Lucentis. So, yes. you know, there again, it comes down mm -hmm. to, e e like, like this uh, person said here, each province has their different <coughs> policies. Each ophthalmologist yeah. has their own individual views. Yeah. Um, some think they're equal. There's evidence that Lucentis is more effective, but again, that that level of increased effectiveness is relatively, in in, in my opinion, not huge. So it may differ from patient to patient. You know, yeah, there there may be underlying differences in in one patient's disease that affects how well either drug works in their eye. So I think there are a lot of variabilities, that, and and I, yeah. I may not be able to answer your question about which one is better. Yeah. So well, when you when you when you've lost your central vision in yeah. one eye yeah. and the yeah. other one is on the skids, mm -hmm. you're going to go for the best yeah. that you can get. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. and and uh, if you know if you can afford the extra, you will do it because it's yeah. your sight. Yeah, right, exactly. And yeah. uh, but I I just yeah. can't get a definitive answer from anybody. Yeah, it, well, it, it's it's difficult. It's uh, it's it's like. A lot of the other studies where, where the, the, the trials are ongoing and there's not yet enough information with enough patients okay. to really be definitive in, in which one is absolutely better. Yeah. And, but I, I can say it. that uh, you know, the, many people think that the gold standard is the Lucentis be, because it's been engineered for the eye. But okay. uh, I think we have to wait a few more years to really understand you know, at, at, at a higher level which one, is, you know, which one is, may be better or maybe not better. But again, you know, there are the other drugs, the ILEA drug coming up that's, that's being re-engineered to be maybe more effective than Lucentis itself. So I think in a couple of years, you might see trials of that, as I said to these other people, trickling up to Canada that you may be able to be eligible for. So. Yeah. Now, Dr. Gendron, yeah. there was a study, I believe it was released last year, mm -hmm. that did do a clinical trial comparing mm -hmm. Lucentis and Avastin mm -hmm. use. And Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I recall that there was a slightly increased risk of strokes and heart disease with yeah. uh, the Aventus than uh, Avastin. Av 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 Avastin, Avastin, sorry, yeah. Avastin yeah. versus Lucentis. Yeah. Yeah. And so Lucentis proved to be a little bit more safer, yeah. for pe for especially yeah. for people who might be at higher risk yeah. of having a stroke mm -hmm. or other. Um, Cardiovascular. Yeah, I mean, you know the, the the drug, the Lucentis, was produced by the companies uh, to be directed against the retina. So there, you know, there, a lot of money and engineering and expertise went into that. So the the problem, the sorry, the problem with anti VEGF drugs, as Aaron just alluded to, is that VGF, which is vascular endothelial growth factor, that's the that's the protein that these drugs are directed against is expressed throughout our bodies, all right? And so that if you, if you use a drug that's targeting VEGF, it could be harmful in other parts of your body. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, you, you might have a, a process going on, wound healing or a cardiovascular process that's going on that if that drug gets out of your eye and then into your systemic circulation, it can affect that process. And that's why, uh, you know, the, the companies uh, directed their efforts into trying to design Lucentis for the eye. Uh, it's not to say that the other one is, can't, can't be as effective, but there are these issues of, of uh, you know, how that drug might get out of the eye and affect the rest of your body. So, so. I know for myself, 
-hmm. I don't have macular degeneration. I have retinitis pigmentosa. Mm -hmm. But if I was in the situation where I had a choice between the two and my provincial health plan covered Lucentis, I know I would be going for the gold standard Lucentis, mm -hmm. and I'd be advocating for myself or my family member to get that gold standard. Mm -hmm. um, and I, here. you're still not covered here. Yeah. Wow. For we, we might have to work on that. So it's nothing yeah. for, costs nothing for the state versus $2,000. Or yeah. you, if you go price low, yeah. you can get it for $1,600 is unhelpful. Hmm. Right. So that uh, that's a good information for us as an organization because mm. we worked with AMD International right. um, on a campaign a few years ago to ensure that all provincial health plans across the country were covering Lucentis. This was before my employment with the foundation, um, so I wasn't aware that we weren't successful in a province, and we may yeah. have to take that up again. It all depends on what province you live in. Yeah, I think it was only since 2009 that they, they approved Avastin. Yeah. So it, it hasn't been all that long even for Avastin. So we, we are behind here. Yeah. It's something maybe the foundation can help with. Absolutely, because yeah. I think you're the only province that mm. does not have mm. a provincial health plan approval for yeah. funding of Lucentis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Gendron, would you like to finish your talk and take yeah. questions at the end? Or yeah, how, are much, you how much more time do we have? You it, have uh, about uh, 10 minutes okay. left. Uh, there so are a couple of you, other things I, I wanted to talk about. So there, do you want to make uh, those points and then we'll yeah, come I, back I can to make some those questions? Points, yeah. okay. um, I, I think what I wanted to end on was, again, the, uh, the fact that, as I mentioned in the other room, that the, the different forms of AMDs, the dry form and the wet form, are multifactorial diseases. Right? So, there's also a lot of uh, research now in trying to figure out the genes that are involved in AMD. And uh, I'd, I'd like to tell you a little bit about that because in, in one way it's exciting, but in another way it's a bit disappointing. And that's because there, there seem to be now many, many genes that might be involved in the different forms of AMD. So as I mentioned that there were 250 genes that are involved in all retinal diseases, now there's at least 18 genes that have been found to be related to one form of AMD or another, mainly the dry form. So some of those genes are genes that are involved in, as I mentioned, the immune system. So uh, there's one gene called the complement factor H, and uh, there are actually companies that have kits that are available that people can go and get themselves tested for these different mutations. But it, it's thought that it really doesn't make much difference because the, 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 the disease is so multifactorial. So if you know you might have a, a mutation of one gene versus another or a group of genes, what seems to be more important overall is overall eye health and overall, uh, you know, uh, whole body health. And so things like uh, the, 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 the risk factors for AMD are aging, of course, uh, smoking, uh, dietary factors, and genetics. But you can affect those, some of those factors. You can stop smoking, you can have change to a healthy diet, and you can try to, you know, affect the outcome of the disease. And so, uh, you know, while, while genetic research is exciting and we're learning more about it, uh, it, it it's a bit confounding in this disease. But there, there is one hopeful thing, though, that another trial that's going on that's just starting is trials for an antibody that's directed against this complement protein. And again, the complement protein is something that in some patients is abnormally deposited in the retina. And what groups are doing now is trying to figure out if they can derive drugs that are very similar to the Lucentis and Avastin that are directed against the complement proteins. And those are going through early stages of a clinical trial now. There's really no information about efficacy, but those, that might be another hope where we can maybe target the immune changes that are occurring around the drusen and around those abnormal tissues to try to stop the progression of dry AMD at least. So that's, th I'd like to end on that uh, because there's some hope there for new treatments as well. The other the other uh, area that, that are others, other areas that are being developed is neuroprotection. So that's an area where instead of trying to target the, the, uh, the, the toxin, you're trying to support the healthy cells. And there are three drugs that are being trialed now in the U.S. that are targeted against trying to uh, increase the health of the photoreceptors and the retinal pigment epithelium. So uh, there, there's fenretinide, there's a drug called NT501, AL8309. These are all drugs that are directed against biological pathways in photoreceptors or retinal pigment epithelium that promote the health and, and block the death of those cells. So again, in the next few years, you might see trials, if they're successful in the U.S., you might see trials of those coming to Canada and eventually, hopefully, another arm of treatment for, for this disease. 
So I, I guess I'll end there. I don't think there was really much more I wanted to talk about other than the questions, which I think we seem to have a lot of. So that's great. You, you haven't mentioned the stem cell research. Oh, okay, right, yeah. Um, everything always escapes me. It's just terrible. And anyway, yeah, the, the stem cell research is really exciting because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, and the reason why I went through the tissues is that we have to realize that the retinal pigment epithelium is kind of like, uh, I, I think of it as the juice bar. Okay, it's, it's in one way, it's the juice bar for the photoreceptors. In another way, it's like the vacuum cleaner. All right, so it, it, that cell layer will actually nourish the photoreceptors, so it produces all those good juices for the photoreceptors so they work properly. But it also takes up a lot of the toxic materials that the photoreceptors make every day. And every night at about 5 o'clock in the morning, those cells are recycling your used-up photopigment in your photoreceptors. And when that process goes wrong, when those retinal pigment epithelial cells stop working like vacuum cleaners and they, and they can't sop up all that toxin, they die. So what are, what's being done now is that there's a group in the U.S. Uh, it's from a company called, I believe, Advanced Cell Technology in California. And they're very interested in using stem cells, which they derive from embryos, human embryos. And they differentiate these stem cells into retinal pigment epithelium that would be normal. And then they take these and, and they inject them subretinally. So they'll take them and inject them into patients or subjects in the study subretinally. And then the cells will form a layer that's like the normal retinal pigment epithelium and then start nourishing the photoreceptors and then acting like they should, like a vacuum cleaner and as a juice bar. So that's being done now. That's in phase two clinical trial. And that means that they're testing the efficacy and the safety of the trial. It's a limited number of patients, but that's ongoing. So I think in the next five or so years, you might start to see efficacy results for that. And, uh, you know, that, that is, a, is a real hope. And, and as you know, I'm sure from the news, there's a lot of talk of stem cells. And the nice thing is that you can now derive stem cells from uh, normal adult tissues. You, you can have, there's, there's work out there where they're taking a, skin, a piece of skin and then using certain chemicals and factors, differentiating those cells that are normally far along a differentiation process back into stem cells, which might be specific to your own body, and then using those cells to create things like retina. So that's very exciting. But again, a very, very uh, early stage of development. And you know, I, I, don't, I don't think that would be available for, you know, for un until the next, within the next decade, I think, if, if, it, were, if it were workable. So. Is, is there any stem cell research being done on directly uh, trying to repair the damaged blood vessels in the underlayer? Ah, stem cells in the blood vessel. Th there is a group in Florida, uh, Mar Maria Grant's group, that's very interested in that. Yeah, the, the, uh, I, I don't know if there are any trials on that yet, but th th that's a great question. I mean, you know, if, if you can uh, renormalize the blood vessels in that area, it would be a great thing. Uh, I, I think, uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't think there are trials, but there are labs that are very interested in, in endothelial stem cells. So it's a, it's a great question. I mean, the blood vessel is yeah, complicated in and of itself because it has its own uh, regulation whereby it has to have the right layers in it, and those layers have to not leak like uh, the garden hose, and, and they have to be uh, regulated so that they don't proliferate. And there's a lot of factors that go into regulating the blood vessel, not only vascular endothelial growth factor, but other factors like... Uh, fibroblast growth factor and platelet-derived growth factor. And those are all involved, so it's very complicated. And uh, I think those studies are probably more at the lab stage now, where they're trying to learn about the basic mechanisms of how to regulate the blood vessels in the retina. Right. And I think you had a question here? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, do these genes like yeah. mutate into other disease, like uh, diabetes or anything yeah. like that? Um, the, the genes that we're talking about here that are, are, are related to uh, Macular degeneration, no, I, I don't think there's any that would change into diabetes. Diabetes is a disease where you have a problem in insulin production, and then the end stage of that disease is because your blood vessels are not healthy, and you get the same thing going on. You get retinal angiogenesis, or blood vessel overgrowth. So it's, it's a very different type of disease from the beginning, but it has the same end effect. Mm -hmm. Not totally the same, but they're very, very, yeah. very large similarities. I think that I had a question earlier about even diseases like ischemic retinopathy, where you get blockage of blood vessels in the retina, and then the blockage will lead to a, a, a lack of oxygen to the retina, and that's, again, a vascular disease, and that, that particular disease might be treatable by some of these, uh, these molecules we talked about today. Mm -hmm. so. No, I had this about two years before I became yeah. a diabetic, okay? Mm -hmm. So I'll just 
you know, when you were speaking about that, I just thought about that. Yeah. No, it, it's a very good question. The only difference, the, o the only difference with uh, diabetes and, and wet AMD is that the blood vessels that, that, but let me just finish with this one. The blood vessels that, that lead to uh, wet AMD are from the back of the eye. The blood vessels that are involved in diabetic retinopathy are from er, inner, inner parts of the retina that are further toward the, the neural layers of the retina. So they're very different bloods, blood supply systems, and there may be differences in those, uh, the way those blood vessels are regulated. But I can also tell you that Avastin and Lucentis are being used to treat um, uh, diabetic macular edema. So there, there are trials now that have shown that it's effective, and it's being used in the clinic to treat diabetic uh, blood vessel overgrowth. So they're also effective there. But a very good question. We had one other? Yeah. Uh, both of us are sisters. Okay. We were diagnosed <laughs> in a month, the same, same month. month. <laughs> really? Oh, okay. So wow. yeah. do I expect my children to, is it hereditary? Some literature says no. Are you talking about the AMD? Yes. Well, again, you know, there are a number of genes, we think now maybe up to 18 genes that might be involved in AMD, so it could be. But again, there are all of these other multifactorial and environmental factors that play into that. So uh, it's, uh, y you know, there, there are tests out there available, but uh, some people think that they're, uh, you know, they're not as important as really trying to alter your lifestyle and your diet and, and the way you take care of yourself that will al alter the outcome of the disease. Gee, that's a good question. I no, when, I go, <laughs> when I go to the eye clinic, yeah, yeah. it's mostly always a female is going with a patch on their eye. I yeah. never see yeah. a man. I've yeah. never seen one. Yeah, no, it, 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 it's, I, I saw a few the other day. Yeah, yeah. It's a good question. It but just I've escapes my one. mind. I, I, I think it's yes. <laughs> Sorry, but I, I think that it is more prevalent in the females. Yeah. I just had a comment. We were talking about the importance of diet and lifestyle modifications. Um, I'm a big fan of the, uh, this book called iFoods, and if you'd like to come take a look at it, uh, it, it uh, holds a lot of practical tips, uh, different foods, uh, uh, what kind of nutrients they, they provide. There's, we have some recipes and stuff like that, so come, uh, come take a look and uh, we can chat about it. Could I ask you about supplements? Uh, you know, you have Occuvite and Vitalux and all that stuff, and then you have... Um, What's the one that made, that's made of the marigold petals and uh, lutein? And uh, that one beginning with the X. Zizanthin. Uh, yeah. I don't know. It's Z Z they, are they beneficial? Yeah. Yeah. Or? That's, that's being tested now. The, 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 the formulation of lutein and zizanthin, in addition to the normal uh, mixture, is being tested now. So uh, yeah. as well, okay. they're also testing the, the effect of, of added supplement of omega-3. So those results should be coming out in the next few years. So, yeah. Uh, so thank you very much for all your questions. Uh, Dr. Jenren, uh, we'll be able to take some more. We have one more comment here from one of our exhibitors, Core Nutrients. And we would love uh, you to speak for a couple minutes and tell us why you're here. So hi, I'm just here uh, representing Core Nutrients. Um, we're basically an evidence-based um, supplier of vitamins for AMD. And currently, we just partnered with Bosch and Lom. Um, and our goal here is to provide patients with very low-cost vitamins. And we also partnered with Bosch and Lom because their formulation, they actually provided the AREDS trial using their product. Um, and if you go, I can talk about more if you come to the booth. I won't take up too much of your time. But basically, um, we're supported by a retina specialist, and he basically you know, talks about what the trial's about and how the vitamins help patients. And some patients actually can't purchase them because they're just way too expensive. But if you go to through Core Nutrients, you can buy it in bulk at a cheaper price, and proceeds go to foundation fighting blindness and other macular research. So we hope that you support this. Thanks. I, I just add that they're very similar, uh, as good as Vitalux, um, some would say uh, better. So um, it would be a discussion you'd want to have with your eye care professional, um, and uh, then you can go from there. Thank you. So I think that's the end of this session, and uh, you take over now? Okay, thanks, Dan.